Hey, welcome to the Dungeon Call podcast. I guess this is how you start. That's pretty um, good. I like that. <laughs> yeah. So let's just roll with it. Ryan, give yourself a little introduction there while I uh, awkwardly transition us into our first podcast nice. recording. I like it. Uh, hey, everybody. I'm I'm Ryan. Um, I've been playing D&D for a little bit here. Uh, I went to school with Braxton, who is the other guy that you heard. He doesn't have a name quite yet, Hello. but his name is Braxton. <laughs> Uh, we've been to school together for a good bit. We met in orientation. Yeah, it was orientation. So the first yeah. the first possible moment we could have met is when we met. Yes. Yeah, we were in a in a group together. Mm-hmm. And I said Had something some... sappy at the end of it, and I was like, oh, "I'm glad that uh, that we met." And then from there, it was kind of <laughs> like off and on. I mean, we lived in the same dorm for the first semester. Yeah, we were, um, we were pretty close by. Yeah, and uh, I I heard bits and pieces about you saying that you did youtube and some streaming mm -hmm. stuff um but i think between the middle of college and near the end is where we really started connecting again and kind of you reached out and said hey you interested in dungeons and dragons i was like i mean yeah i guess <laughs> sure <why not? laughs> i don't exactly remember my thoughts of it at that time <laughs> but uh i guess introducing myself a little bit more um braxton i don't know if i should give my last name we'll keep that confidential for a little bit <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you said it. I don't think he did. Um, but no, I studied uh, theater pretty much all throughout any school that I could have been in, you know, be it like elementary, middle school, uh, high school, and into college. It became my uh, major. I don't know if you'd be able to tell that I'm a theater student because I'm pretty crap <laughs> at speaking into a mic. Um, well, not all, all theater people <laughs> use microphones. No, but I've always had interest in voice acting, and I guess kind of that's what launched me into nerdy things is when I was a kid. Um, most of you will probably know Toonami had a lot of those anime that <laughs> were being made. Yeah, I never Japan. watched Toonami. I did. That was my lifestyle. But that was when I didn't even know it was <laughs> anime. Um, and not that this is an anime podcast because it's not, but I'll most certainly mention it <laughs> a good bit because that's yeah, all no, I do. I have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah. Until I uh, start getting into it more, which hopefully maybe more will happen. Hopefully maybe, point. yeah, because you showed me a uh, soundtrack. Ryan's super into music. He actually implements that into a lot of stuff. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. And I think <laughs> I kind of want to begin with, Ryan, what made you want to start dungeon mastering or just D&D &D in general? Uh, well, uh, as we talked about, my I've been streaming here on Twitch for the last, I don't know, three years or something like that. And before that, I did YouTube. But with uh, with my streaming stuff, there was a, a streamer I watched by the name of Bro Tato, and he started getting into uh, Dungeons and Dragons stuff. I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting. I mean, I like fantasy things. I want to watch it. But then he started he started mentioning um, different you know different productions, bigger. This is around the time that Critical Role just started taking off, and other big. You know, people were kind of looking at what they were doing and started their own D and D podcasts or their own D and D shows. And so, I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll check it out. Could be interesting. And it took me a bit to start kind of falling in in love with the idea of it. Uh, I think it, it wasn't until I started getting back into writing that I was like, this could be a really cool conjunction of right. two worlds of having a, a cool story that you that you want to tell, but then having people take part in the story at the same time and going back and forth and i love improv i, I love uh whose line is it anyway I watched that <laughs> for years and years and years and so it's like a it's a beautiful conglomeration of different worlds all together yeah no it's it's really interesting but it's always been hard for me to wrap my head around which is why i tend to stay on the player side of things but we've talked in depth a bit about beginnings and where to start since i'm kind of peeking into uh being a dungeon master but that's my next question for you is how did you start? Where did you begin? You didn't really have the guidance that I have through you. Again, though, there is Google and resources yeah, on lot, there. Yeah, a lot of good resources. How there. do you find what you want to use, where you want to go? How did you start making a world? A lot of free time. A lot of free time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, that happens in college. Yeah. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of, you know, sleepless nights. Like, man, I, I don't know what to do with my time here. Uh, but when I f first started getting into it, I was... Um, well, first, actually, what, what started me getting, what made me reach out to you, actually, to, to start an actual campaign and stuff was uh, my girlfriend at the time. I had just started getting into D&D, &D and she was the person that I would kind of bounce ideas off of. Hmm. So I I DM'd for her for just, I did a one-person D&D session with, right, with her. Right, I remember that. 
Yeah, we ran the uh, the beginners box thing. The uh, for those of you who played it before, the you know the fan, the, I think it's Fan Delver's Mine or something. See, I I know a lot about I don't know, I don't know a lot about the um the main stories and the 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 Wizards of the Coast produced stuff. Yeah, I do a lot. I try to do a lot of homebrew stuff, but I'm pretty sure it was the fan the Fan Delver Mine. And we did the first half of that. Like this is pretty fun. This is pretty cool. But I don't I don't like the restrictions that the module gave me. This is before yeah. I, I I figured that I could you know kind of bend things and change things and then <laughs> <laughs> rules are change. made to be broken. Yeah, and so I was pretty you know pretty intense with it, and so like yeah, oh, I'll reach out to some friends. So I gave a, a couple people some messages and a couple people messaged back like yeah we'll, we'll give it a shot. Mm-hmm. But for the first session, because I wasn't sure if we were gonna you know if I wanted to make a full story, if anybody that I was playing with was gonna be interested, it's like we'll just do a a, a crappy little one shot here. <laughs> And it wasn't crappy. I, it was pretty fun. Well, you have Matt Colville to thank for that. <laughs> uh, for those of you who, uh, who know Matt Colville, he's a pretty popular in the in the YouTube D and D scene. And he just recently started his own. Uh, he did Kickstarter, and he recently started his own D and D show as well on mm. Twitch. But he uh, he does the the series of YouTube videos where he kind of walks through DMing and and different. Uh, which probably uh, if you're getting into DM. Uh, here comes my cat. If you get into to DM, DMing, this might be a, a, a good resource to check out. He's got a lot of a lot of videos there. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he is one specifically talking about kind of like a first session, getting involved with it. And he, he recommended this small, short little dungeon. Hmm. And I, I basically executed that to a T uh, with you guys. <laughs> so I wasn't sure, you know, I, I just w- wasn't sure if we were going to do anything with it. Was that the one that had the riddles in it? Yeah, yeah, it was a uh, um, the the Dalian tomb, I think. Oh um, yeah. yeah, and I got the sword. <laughs> yep, I remember yep. that. I nailed I'm all pretty those sure, riddles, by the way. Yeah, I'm pretty sure everything that was in there, except for I might have changed the riddle. I'm not positive. Everything that was in there was uh, was what he had given for his little camp. And this is before I, I used to print out all my papers and everything. And now yeah. I use uh, use OneNote to save the environment. Save, yeah, no. <laughs> having a theater background, we print literally everything, and yeah, even in yeah. my job now that I have. Oh boy, but Just off topic there, bears. I guess you kind of touched on it, but um, if I remember correctly, we had people fall off in that first, se- that first session we had, yes. um, which sucks, but I mean, either Dungeons and Dragons isn't for everybody, it does take a bit, a bit of time. Um, where did you go next to find people to join your campaigns? Because we lived on a college campus, so obviously there's a lot of people, but yeah, it can, can be, be tough. tough. Yeah. I think uh, I'm sure we'll have a whole session of this at some point, but scheduling yeah. and finding people is miserable. Yes. Probably <laughs> the, the hardest part of, about DMing, especially if it falls. Sometimes a player is super involved with one of the, like, especially if the player is the person that gets everybody involved in the first place, then that can be quite handy. But whoever is scheduling everything and getting everybody compiled compiled together can be a pain in the keister. Yeah, and I think that kind of is in this big overarching thing of what a dungeon master's duties are. Yeah. And what do you feel like that entails? What do you think the duties of a dungeon master should be? Make a big cool question, world. But yeah. Okay, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I guess you don't have to. You make can it use... badass, that's it. <laughs> yeah, just make an awesome thing and let the players go crazy in it. Um, cause I mean, you, you don't have to make your own world. I think that that's, I think when a lot of people get into DMing or D and D, I think that's what they're afraid of that. They, I, you know, I watch, uh, Matt Mercer make this crazy cool world. I got, I have to do that. But it's, it's too much. I can't, I can't be that guy. I think it's important to know you don't have to be that guy. You can be your own, your own cool individual. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can use, I mean, there's plenty of modules out there. Wizards of the Coast puts out a lot. You don't even have to know the lore and history behind them. Just grab a book, start running through it. Yeah. Uh, in that first campaign, we we did about a quarter of the Curse of Strahd book just because it was interesting and I love the story behind it. Blew my mind when you mentioned that that's what it was. <laughs> yeah, I had just, no uh, idea. Some vampire stuff. The castle was pretty much the same that we had in there. Um, but we just didn't have the time to run the whole book, and there was parts of it that I didn't like, so I, I you know I cut and pieced things out. But uh, I think just. Caring about your players, I think that that's a, that's an important aspect about being yeah. a, a dungeon master. Caring about knowing and knowing that it's not your story; it's it's uh, it's everybody's story. It's that's when when we get worried about railroading and things yeah. like that. Or someone wants to tell a story, but they don't 
they don't want input they just want to tell what they have involved what yeah. they have ideas of that's another tough thing as well is i mean especially with reddit and anybody you talk to they get kind of stuck on this quote-unquote railroading thing especially with um play podcasts or whatever they're called whenever mm -hmm. it's just people playing D, D on a podcast um they'll say ah oh, the dungeon master was just kind of hardcore railroading his players towards this one thing for the sake of a story yeah. for the sake of the podcast uh so i mean me and you have talked pretty extensively about this but what's your thought on it i mean you can only prep so much beforehand um, <laughs> and whether you let the players throw it all out and can accept that is on you and what, what does that yeah. look like for you when it happens? What, how do you prepare? I think you have to be you have to be prepared for the unexpected all, all the time. You never know exactly how things are going to go. And you have to hope that your players care about the story you're trying to tell and that they are going to be nice enough to grab the hooks that you mm. throw out there. <laughs> There's something um, about that, too, that uh, I think having a player like me in a campaign <laughs> is pretty useful for. Because I yeah. noticed when um, I've, the very few times I've DM'd, I think it's like three or four times, um, the party that I have right now, which you're included in, is pretty, mm -hmm. like, that's not my problem <laughs> in a lot of situations. But there's this one player that was just like, is somebody dying? I have to save them. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> it's and, always nice to have that. <laughs> and I think that's kind of the role that I fill in a group dynamic, at least in our campaign. <laughs> And just yeah. naturally, I since it's really my first character, kind of it's it's my second, but they're very similar. Um, no, I it, I always play the curious cat, and, uh, <laughs> which is very uh, nice to a DM. <laughs> yeah, um, they always, I've heard people will talk about how they just want to mess with their dungeon master, so they're not gonna oh, like grab any of the hooks or anything. So I think to to go back to the railroading thing, yes, as a DM, you just have to make sure. I think it helps you tie in your players to the story because then they're they're gonna want it they're gonna want to care about what's happening. So let's say for example, there's a a player that has a a family member or something. If you take that family member and throw them in their face or something, or, or they're in danger or you know, something along those lines, more than likely the character or the player is going to care and they're gonna want to do something about it. If they yeah. don't, then I think it's also important to show repercussions. So let's say there's a for example, uh, we'll probably pull from our own campaign quite a bit here. There's a time where the party that that I, I DM for was told about this mine that there was, you know, things going, things were happening at this mine. They eventually investigated it, and there were mine flares and different oh, things happening at this God. mine. <laughs> and it was, <laughs> yeah, it was almost almost death for the party, but they they made it out alive. But for example, if they hadn't gone there or hadn't done something or had seen this place and decided to uh, screw this, whatever, there's a possibility. I think it's important to show that it's a possibility that something bad could come of it. Mm -hmm. That if these if these hooks aren't grabbed, the, the, the goblin camp on the outside of town is not taken care of and the party decides to go north. Next time they come to the town, everyone's dead or some the innkeeper or some, some NPC the party cared about has been murdered because mm -hmm. the party just didn't do something that they that could have been useful for them that's something i always liked about your sort of storytelling style and we play video games a lot like both me yeah. and you do and we love single player experiences but what i've realized is that those are designed like the title says for a single player right the world revolves around them and there are some games that kind of circumvent this and try to but yeah there's the the elephant in the room skyrim <laughs> not a single thing in that game happens without you being there yeah you single-handedly solve every single problem if there is a problem there You're always and the hero if, if you join i don't know i guess i just love the dark brotherhood if you join the dark brotherhood and you start an assassination quest and you like you go to the place that you need to kill the person with your bow with and you've got poison prepped on it, you go hold on i think i want to go join the fighters guild right now and you just leave that situation and, you know, the wedding's going on in, in, in solitude and you just, you say, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to the Fighters Guild right now. <laughs> Become a werewolf. Sorry, spoilers for you. Um, oh. <laughs> but that moment will stay there for 
ever until you come back to it until you make yeah. it your active quest and go and and finish and, and, and kill it, yeah yeah so that's what i really like about what you've done and how you talk about it being a living world stuff is going to happen without you yeah and it's scary and as a player it makes me like feel weird because i can't just <laughs> stop doing a quest and it will be just as i left it nice and pretty with a bow on top it, it's yeah, that's just, not how it is come back to that one later yeah <laughs> so i've always gravitated to the games that are like and uh, kingdom come deliverance is a great one for that you're just a normal dude just kind of walking around the world uh are we even playing outward together yeah uh, that's kind of similar where we're not necessarily the hero we're just kind of random people thrown into the world mm -hmm. um but i think as a dm there's small things that can really make a world feel like it's a living breathing experience that being one of them having you don't have to have a you know, a crazy pimped out calendar and have holidays and everything, but having just a semblance of weeks and days and right. time in your world can be super important. Yeah. Having players go or NPCs going around doing things while the players are off doing their own thing. Just small, small little details can, can change the experience. Exactly. And I think there's this one moment in one of the campaigns that you've run for me where we had gone off to do something or gotten teleported to a different place and then we finally had come back to where we were and everything was different and then that was the moment that i realized this is not my single player experience <laughs> <laughs> things are happening so i guess in this sort of same vein the same subject how much do you overwhelm your players with things to do and and paths to take because i know from a player perspective it it's crazy understanding this is a, a world who doesn't stop for my single character yeah. or our party and you give us four or five six different leads how do mm. you how do you balance that and how do you sort of test your players what i like to do uh and it's probably because i've i've gotten into critical Role and watched that for a good bit i like having specific stories for my for each player for each you know for each uh, character I'll have a backstory that hopefully that they've put a good chunk of work into and then an overarching story that's going on in the world at the time. Some, you know, some plot lines, some different stories and things that are happening in the background that kind of can tie into the character. And so I have one for each player. And right now we have four, technically five, uh, who kind of drops in and out. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I have a little bit prepared for everybody. And then with that, there's a you know larger story, and then there's you know some side stuff in the different towns that you guys go to. And so I try to show to to throw in a, a couple things. This way, uh, a it doesn't make me you know have just one storyline that you guys have or not not necessarily railroaded into, but you feel like you feel obliged to go do this one thing because it's the only thing you've been given. So I don't want to just toss one thing at you, but I want to try to toss things that. A R makes sense to the story, even though they might not right away. As you guys can, you know, continue to dive into it, you might uncover small little secrets and details. Um, but I also want to have things that each party member will will care about, not necessarily the the characters, but each uh, each player will care about. Yeah. Uh, and I'm sure we'll probably touch on this at some point down the line as well. For like a session zero, I did a a little a little two pamphlets actually, one mm. that did backstory for the character, so I could just pull from that whenever i needed to and also I, th I found it gets the players more invested in their character yeah and i also did this little sheet that uh that i got on the internet and then i tweaked a little bit i wish i could find the original document now but i can't mm -hmm. i mean i know uh, i turned mine <laughs> into you late because i had written so much and you're like oh i wasn't i didn't i didn't need, to, I didn't need you to like do all that and i was like I, 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 you gave me yeah, the opportunity yeah. I'm all I'm all for that. I have a player right now who continues to just send me more things about his character, and I, I can't it. tell at all because <laughs> he's such a quiet person, and I'm so mm -hmm. so intrigued as to what he's yeah. doing. But his, that was his... one of my next questions. Is uh, sorry to run over you there, but uh, mm -hmm. how do you tackle a session zero? So I mean, just oh, well, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, I like to to let let the players know what the campaign's going to be about. Um, not necessarily what the storyline is, but what the feel, what the tone will be. If it's a little, because some people prefer, you know, a fun experience and that's it. Mm -hmm. Some people prefer the darker experience and that's it. Some people like everything in between. So I, I, I try to cater a little bit to each player, 
but I let everyone know that it's going to be a little bit of a darker experience with, you know, a lot of fun things leaked in there just because that's the type of person that I am. That's the type of type of stuff I write. Um, I don't want to make sure everyone's okay with that. That they're all they're all down to to get weird and get dark and get silly yeah. at the same time. So to kind of lean more into the theme that people have decided on that your your party has said that they prefer. Um, I have written down and I can see this in my note right here. It just is music. Music? Music? Question mark? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think music, and we'll probably have a whole session on it as well. Music can vary. I, I also come a little bit from a film background. I almost came to school for film, but I'm, I'm going into the more psychology direction now. And if you listen to, if you watch a horror movie with, you know, happy, fun music, it's going to be a completely different experience than if you got the, yeah. you know, the, the, the creepy music in the background <laughs> instead. So that inspired me to make a bunch of playlists, listen to a bunch of music and find different, you know, I have a playlist for if you guys are in a tavern, just some background tunes, mm -hmm. some some spooky tense music, some sad. I find the sad music hits the, I think hits oh the hardest. <laughs> it's a sad moment, boom, hit that playlist, <sighs> get, get the tears rolling, there you go. Have a so I guess time. to sort of save the material for other times to talk about it, um, this touches on you having to put things together and be prepared for the next session. Uh, and I've always been interested and I'm not sure why we've talked, we've not talked about this before. I think it might be because of the confidentiality of the whole story, but right. you have specific days per prep and what does that look like? Say it's either session zero or session one or after a big event has happened. What does your prep look like? Where do you start when you sit down and you say, Hey, I need to start working on my next D and D session. Like, it, I'm talking like go go in yeah. depth on this. It can be tough. Um, for session zero specifically, I just kind of I will kind of ask the players ahead of him what, what they expect to be playing. Like I, I knew what you were probably going to be playing. Uh, <laughs> you'd give me a couple of ideas, and so just just so I have the basic premise. I'll print out a whole bunch of sheets to let them know the air because I, I usually will have a specific. Um, granted, I've only run two kind of lengthy campaigns now this one's going on for like seven months now something like that man uh yeah time flies <laughs> it does it really does um but I'll, I'll i'll kind of prepare an initial area so I, i'll let the players know what's going to be happening in this area what's what the current world looks like so you guys know what the what the lore of the area is and then let you make a character and then we'll have kind of some one-on-one -on -one sessions and chat about it a little bit more but from there for like a session one I, I wanted to have something that you want. I think you want something that starts quick, like a like a Shakespeare you know, play or a, a good book or a good movie. You want something that leaps into the that something grabs the the players and the party there's, pretty there's fast. A, there's a word for that starting um, after the action has, uh, yeah. has already begun, and I learned this in school, and I went to school for basically just this, and I cannot remember. <laughs> Still paying off those loans. Yeah, yeah, you're out of. I mean, you're out of school, and boom, it's all out of your head now. It's only been a few months, though. <laughs> it happens. Let me tell you, um, adult life, man. But yeah, adult uh, life. You, you want something that that's intense. So uh, I, I planned. Uh, I also I took a little bit from some some of the, the modules and books that I'd read, and I had a festival. I think festivals a great way because then there's a reason for every person to be there. They they want money. They want to hang out. They want to drink. Whatever festival throw everyone in there then have something bad happen at the festival boom there you go and then spread out the story from there and get crazy with it but for example for let's say you know session 20 or session 30 whatever so you finished off that first little hook of my goblins attack the festival what do you do next what's the next plan mm -hmm. i think you want to try to have ideas for what you want to do so have small little hooks here and there, like for like for the example the uh the mine that we had talked about earlier, that had been hinted in in like session two, I yeah. think. You guys were in, in a town and the the prices were a little higher, and you're like, what's the yeah? We deal went to the this? armor, and he said, hey, I've got this uh, lack of materials coming in, usually from this mine down in this southeastern area of the map. Uh, I've heard there's something going on right now. If you guys figure out what's going on there. It, that, that's all it was. He said, figure out what's going <laughs> yeah, on there. I'll give you a discount. On. Not even solve you know, the it. distance. He doesn't know what's happening. He is, his prices are a little, you know, a little, a little more expensive now. He wants to know what's going on. 
So you, you agreed, yeah, sure, we'll do it. And for if you guys had gone there, I'd try to scale my background things to what your guys' levels are. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I, none of you know what happened down there, but it was not fun. It was fun yeah, from you, a player's perspective, but my, we all almost died. And we got this sensation there. Too. Yeah, if you'd gotten there straight away, obviously it wouldn't have been mind flares and things in your face. I'm not. I'm not trying to baby mind flares. Kill the players. Yeah, I think it just would have been the inklings of something happens. Like for like that um that city, the small little encampment that the mind flares had built up, probably wouldn't have been as intensive or as built up. Maybe the mind flares hadn't even moved in quite yet. Just small little things. Like uh, with each player's backstory, I try to have it built around what you guys are up to. Mm, right, and that's another thing that I'm always curious about in a video game um you've got a loot system that gives Mm -hmm. you know a chest properties that randomly puts in an item there maybe there are some systems to see what items the player uses i've always thought that skyrim probably does that or different games oh yeah that Um, yeah they have loot tables yeah you know if the player is a rogue they'll probably get a bow more often than they'd get a great hammer or a war axe or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something there they would and utilize. This is something that always it doesn't bother me as a player, but it's interesting to think that the DM has placed every single item mm-hmm. in the game, and I pick up something, and you know we've got a party of four, and it's <laughs> it's it's glowing purple, and it has tentacles on it. It's my characters. It's a warlock <laughs> thing. Um, and before you guys ask, yes, my warlock is a tiefling. I am the most basic player there is. Uh, <laughs> how how do you balance that concept? I mean, every if everything I pick up is completely tailored to my player, then it doesn't feel like this is a world yeah. that exists without me. And I think that's really tough because, you know, on the same side of that, on the same side of the coin, you know, I don't want to pick something that is completely useless to my character. Exactly. So what do you do? Well, to answer your question, yes and no, everything is placed for the players. Some things are improvised in the moment. I have a a loot table, for example, if you guys kill something and I wasn't ready, I didn't prepare anything for that guy, I'll just grab a quick little thing from that and boom, now this knight had a, I don't know, shriveled up hand on him for some reason. (laughs) That's some of my favorite things. I'll just completely improvise something that That they have and then you you guys go into detail lines like, well, then that can spark ideas for me like why does this knight have this oh because he's this guy he's a cultist for this thing he's been involved with these guys in the background stuff like that but there's also there's a roll table in the uh, dungeon master's guide that i've used quite a bit for for treasure hordes and things so let's say if you guys have a you know a challenge rating a cr rating of a six monster or something you can roll on that or in a treasure horde uh, overall a challenge rating of 10 you can roll on that one or two times find a well the d100 and it'll say you know roll on magic table b or something and you can go to that and let's say you get a random magic item let's say it's the armor of vulnerability or whatever why does this guy have an armor of vulnerability sitting in this treasure who knows maybe it's uh, an old castle and now it's just dusty and it's been hanging out there um so you can find small things like that but i like to make sure each player is happy with what they have it's like in the last campaign we got a player pretty late on and everyone else was finding magic items and well it's had cool things and he didn't have anything and so in the castle i made sure that there was something specific for i think it was a bard there was something specific for a bard there that he could use and have fun with so in case like that obviously it's you know specific to the player but i think it's important to balance the realist realisticness that's not a word but i'm gonna make it one the the realistic nature of the world with the you know the gaminess of of the of D to make sure all the players are happy everyone has things that they like occasionally you'll have people that you know will, will grab every single thing not like when i want to have anything else but uh, that's just that's how know. our brains have been conditioned with video games <laughs> Yeah, you want to have every every fun, cool item. Yeah. Speaking of that bard, uh, got a text from him this morning that said, hey, I'm running a, uh, a draft for the new Magic the Gathering uh, set that's coming out. And I go, I moved to Chicago. Oh, no. And he goes, oh, shit. <laughs> for which I have not responded to because we're podcasting right now. <laughs> Hopping over to Chicago. No big deal. I mean, I left quickly. Uh, mm-hmm. I graduated two days later, had an interview, and then got the job a week and later, boom. and I was like, I guess I'm here. 
Uh, and then I was like, hey, Ryan, um, how do we keep me in this campaign? But online yeah. also. <laughs> yeah, Which so is a thing that we've had to tackle, all, yeah. Give us um, a monitor. I had a computer. I just move over there and boom. And nowadays, um, I guess there is always the choice of do you do it in person or do you find your favorite friends online and, and yeah. you know do it through maybe Tabletop Simulator or some of the other resources that are available to connect people in a single game and let them see the same world. Um, for us, um, I remember the end of our first campaign, um, I had to leave because every summer I went back home. Um, my college was just five hours away from, well, I say just, but like all of Texas, um, away from <laughs> my home. And I lived in the dorms and I couldn't stay in the dorms during the summer because I needed to work and save up money. Uh, so it sucked. I had to go home and leave this campaign. And something that Ryan had done for my character was, um, even without my knowledge, had a little session about me leaving, but sent me like two, three pages of oh yeah a, a story a little a little situation we'll of my off. character leaving and i was in the car um in the back seat with my brother to my left my sister to my right uh who are both older than me love them both i live with my brother right now um we were going to a dinner or something with our parents and i was reading that and i i started to tear up and that's that's how important at least for a player like me it is to uh really feel like my backstory is woven into this he had my brother returning um, which the whole campaign have been searching for him and we've gotten separated since he, well, well before the events of the campaign had begun. Mm -hmm. And he had been dropping inklings of things here and there to try to, you know, begin this storyline for my, my character to reunite with my brother. And in this write-up that you had done, and I wasn't expecting it, you had slowly started foreshadowing him coming in and then bam he was there and i was just like holy oh gosh <laughs> but yeah i think in cases yeah. like that I'm, I'm all right with i think railroading is okay because i wanted to and i wanted that to happen in in session i wanted to bring in <sighs> your i wanted to oh well I wanted to have your brother pull you out and have this I'd whole have thing with it <laughs> but you had to leave earlier than we expected yeah so i was like okay i i, I want to send them off i don't want to just you know boom now, now uh, nowhere is gone, which is his character's name. Now nowhere just disappeared. I wanted a, an actual send off for this player, for this character. So yeah, I wrote up this whole thing, and then I, I don't think I read it in the session because I think I posted it for everyone to just go ahead and read. And I just we just kind of jumped to the next day. I know, JD. <laughs> this sad day. Um, and I've, you talked with a few players, and it's I think it's. I mean, that's the most important thing you can do as a DM is tie your characters, make your players, your, your the characters have an impact on the world around you. Yeah. And I think that's sort of a good transition now to kind of flip things on its head. And if you had any questions that you wanted to ask me as a player, <laughs> you yeah, could do that. I've only, uh, I, I've been, I, I guess we never even mentioned this. I've been DMing for not, I mean, not terribly long in the grand scheme of things, but for like three and a half years, I think. Yeah, been, I mean, you had one campaign and that, I mean, ended just because people had to leave in college. That's how it works out. But we found out the power of the internet, and <laughs> you made a world from that this world. New, this new internet. I currently now play as Nowhere's brother. <laughs> so it's kind of changed a bit. Uh, but no, you've been you've been DMing for a long time, and I guess in that same exact time frame, I have been a player for. Mm -hmm. I've only campaigns. been a player three times for my campaigns that i've started doing yeah did two two for your campaign and then one for a one shot that you did yeah for um when i i just had too much on my plate i wasn't able to to prepare as much as i would have liked yeah we had some so players you, did, out you ran a well. one shot for us yeah you ever to play out a couple players out yeah but i don't know what, what do you want to know from a, a player's perspective well the big question i have to ask and i'm oh, interested oh, to man. see okay <laughs> I, I really best. only have one, one, one important question here about this. I have a couple others that we can answer together. Uh, but how do you tell? Because I mean, you've been, like I said, you've been playing for a bit. How do you tell how much to, to speak? Because obviously, you want everyone else to, you want everyone to have a chance to be in the spotlight, to do cool things, and to to chat. But how do you, how do you balance that with your own speaking to you know and doing things in game? The ideal world, and especially coming from a theater background, is that every person involved in a scene and a situation says what they need to say. 
right. and you have as little out of character moments as possible so that it functions as a di- as a group dynamic if somebody's more talkative like my characters tend to be then that works because it's their character and everybody else is silent because their character would be silent but obviously we don't live in an ideal world and we all are kind of new players here uh, aside from me um it depends because there's situations where I can tell the group is either uncomfortable acting or playing their character and I have to yeah. guide and push them. Uh, so that decides a lot of what I say and what I don't say. If if they need to be pushed or I need to kind of act as the leader of the group, I'll speak. But my now, desire... Oh, you go ahead. I was just gonna, how, how easy is it for you to tell that now that you're not in person anymore? Um... Uh, it's pretty hard to uh, inter- interrupting or interjecting into a moment that's silent is hard because there's a good bit of lag with the video and the sound. Mm-hmm. So sometimes I'll say something and people start speaking. But the thing that has come out of that is that I can't butt in all the time, which is, is right. good. I don't want to I don't want to be that selfish, single player minded game that this is my world. Um, they've had to start speaking more. And it's helped the group dynamic a lot. But to answer, I guess, the first question you had, at the very beginning, honestly, I just wanted to be the main character and speak as much as I could. <laughs> just flat out putting that there. <laughs> I, um, I mean, it was honestly one of the big reasons why the initial campaign that I ran ended. Because uh, you had left, you were one of the big talkers. I had a couple other players who, we had a lot, kind of a rotating cast there for the, the last um, couple months. Yeah. I was uh, we had people, there. yeah, we had people coming in, coming out, and leaving. Um, and then it, the people that were left were a group of people who were not, not yeah. super vocal, not pretty, not none of them were leader type individuals. And one of my favorite things was there was this whole story where they they wanted to talk to a guy in a tavern. They spent like forty minutes trying to decide <laughs> how to speak oh to this God. guy. They they lined out so many different options. And just never grabbed on one of them. They kept kind of looking at me to try to do something. And I, I, I you know, I kind of had people come up and talk to him. I eventually just like said, okay, just, just pick some, just try something. And, you know, it, it, one of, it might end poorly, but it might, it might work out. And they just ended up walk, just walking up and having a chat with the guy. Oh my god, that, that's as simple as it turned out to be. Yeah, um, I guess in the beginning it kind of felt as though I was DMing the group from a player perspective. Mm-hmm. For, for a good bit and I didn't hate it um, but it was interesting uh, to think about and I, I wasn't expecting that question at all honestly um, at this point I just kind of let you handle everything and okay. I speak when I feel the moment arises it's on an, it's on a need to basis um, I've really definitely gotten more comfortable with the, the dynamic yeah you have so I, I, there, there are times when I really don't notice it at all I'm just there but my desire kind of proceeds over, you know, the mindset of when to speak, when not to speak, because the best situation is when I'm so into it that yeah. whether I am speaking or not is purely motivated by my character. So I guess, again, to answer it is when when would my character speak? I think that's a good way to do it. And I've noticed um, now that you guys are more comfortable with your characters and doing things your character would do, if I... I can let you guys go crazy for a little bit, have some conversations. But if I see there's a lull in the conversation or you guys are silent for a little bit, then I, I can find transitions or an NPC will come up and, and spark something. Yeah. Um, early on, I was much more, you know, kind of not not too confident in, at doing things like that. But as time's gone on, I think I've gotten a little better with it. That's definitely one of the hardest things for me when I've uh, done my few sessions is... I swear it, it got quiet. And if I bring somebody <laughs> in now... They're gonna know I'm just trying to break the ice. Yeah, it's it's tough to balance. It really is. Um. So another question. This one we can kind of answer together. JD, do you want to answer too, buddy? Come on. Uh, what mm-hmm. can a player do to make the DM's life easier in game? I know we, we've kind of touched on a little bit with. Oh boy. Kind of reaching out and, and talking and, and being there, but what else do you think that they can do? Oh boy. Like, what do you do? What do you think you do to make my life easier? Uh, my character's curious. Um, I think always, you mentioned this a lot, and it's a concept in improv and theater that kind of is the golden rule is yes and. Mm-hmm. So never 
try to purposefully screw with your DM's plan. Again, you probably wouldn't be in the group if you had the mindset of, by the end of this, I'm going to kill every player and ruin the story. <laughs> but it's it's that balancing line of, do you lean into railroading and let this campaign preside over your character? Mm -hmm. Or do you kind of DM yourself, uh, in a sense, and you're writing a story with your character? Uh, I think... That, that's a that's a tough thing to answer yeah i think for me it helps when you guys r care about your characters and have a cool you have have some stuff in your backstory for me to pull from i think that yes, helps a lot i think that is the biggest thing i noticed because with nowhere it pretty much was he has no family they all are dead <laughs> and he has a twin brother but the and lore stuff with your warlock was the stuff that i would pull from a lot yes so i think being malleable with the backstory and mm -hmm. giving your dm should they be really excited about writing stories which they should be um just letting them handle that as they as they will don't be stiff and unchanging now what can i do as a dm to make your time more enjoyable oh, oh god ryan <laughs> oh man um what, what's the stuff that you that you you find that you enjoy the most when, uh, I, I love when getting items specific to me just because that's how I've I've been trained with <laughs> video games. You know, I hear about a freaking sword that turns undead and does fire damage. <laughs> Dawnbreaker, yes, give that to me. Does that's it look badass? Want. I want it in my hand. <laughs> that, that sword was in my hand in every session, whether I used one-handed swords or not. That was my mm -hmm. weapon. Um, that's always fun. Um, uh, go, to go back to that mind with the mind flares... If you facilitate my desire to play Carrion, who is Nowhere's brother, my current character, mm -hmm. that's all I want. I want an environment that allows me to fully dive into the world. And you're great at that. And I know this is a vague answer, but my, my, my biggest want is to just be the character that I am rather than okay. out of character okay what's happening here or trying to think yeah. about guiding the group into a thing i want to if we could have a rule for no out of character questions that'd be <laughs> awesome but that's yeah. hard and that i don't hard. even know things all the time about the rules so now, do you, that, that's what my do you desire think, what do you think helps you the most get it? do you think the music the like Ooh. important descriptions of things or sound effects or music or just a con that, of all that so i i, I noticed through being at the table with you the music was a an amazing thing and i want to save this moment that i always tell you about for another time <laughs> uh where music was just extremely effective um yeah when i lost music by being on discord and not being able to hear it i was taken out of the session immensely and yeah, it was it was harder for me to get into weird it, it was tough and I, I didn't say this a lot and i had I didn't have a thought of like, hey, this isn't entertaining to me, but there were moments where I just got bored. And I think those moments were the ones where our group was trying to plan something for too long. Right, um, which will happen. <laughs> yeah, or, you know, it, it came about because it's hard to break out being a TV in a room full of people talking to the DM. Yeah. Um, Luckily, music we were is able to fix important. that, though. Yeah. Um, so you got some tunes. <laughs> so we had it fixed, and as soon as I came back, um, it... It helps immensely. I think it, it really immerses me into the moment, and I find it to be a very important part. But uh, there was another thing you'd asked. Um, was it, in general, what helps me get into the session? Yeah. What do you um, think brings you in to be a player or be, a, so, be involved okay. in the world more? I've got the checklist. Magic items that are dope and cool. <laughs> Music that is also dope and cool and sometimes sad uh -huh. and facilitates moments. Um this is a really big personal preference, but uh, political stuff and war, that bores the okay. ever living Christ out of me. Yeah. <laughs> if I'm like, uh, and this isn't to bash on anything that's happened recently, like that wasn't the typical war situation where we were being diplomatic. Like, oh, um, I see what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't, and I, I don't know if this is relevant because it's not from a objective player's perspective. But if I'm in a room talking to somebody about the logistics of why they want to stab somebody in the face, but it's not engaging, 
and it's just like hey i need you guys to go stab something in the face that sucks mm-hmm. i want it to be led up to by a story yeah. and i want to know a reason yeah, yeah yeah so i mean it's just general good storytelling rules um things that help me get more into the story is knowing more about my uh fellow party members my players mm-hmm. that helps a lot and you guys talk you know not behind my back but individually <laughs> just like i talk to you individually and Aloric, um who's the name of um Daniel's character, who you've mentioned, has this huge backstory that he's always sending oh, you yeah. stories from. I haven't seen any of it, and I'm so damn curious. <laughs> and anytime his character peaks up a bit, and I can play off of that, it pulls me straight in. Yeah, I'm super, super excited to involve some. This is the problem: is that you guys aren't around things that would, you know, that would yeah. facilitate that to to come out. Yeah, that's another tough thing. Um, something that always helps is, you know, of course, I would love to have you. I, I like being ra- ra- railroaded, to be honest. I don't mind it as long as it's written well. Um, but I hate being in that, that like, limbo of we just did a thing. What do we do? Yeah, now what? I hate that. Um, and, again, this isn't an objective player's perspective because that's what I want. Um, but I need to have something, like, right there. Bam, bam. There's something for me to do. Right. Something to, to head off and continue to continue the adventure with. Yeah, and I, I recognize that there are some players that possibly would absolutely love to have an entire world prepped, and the DM yeah. goes, what do you do? And doesn't what guide do them do? at all. I recognize that there are people like that. <laughs> I don't think it's bad. I think it would be amazing mm-hmm. to be able to do that, but that's a Yeah, lot. that's why I, I have kind of a, a whole world prepped, just in case you guys decide to just screw it and get on a boat and head somewhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but... Um, I think also it's important as a, as a new DM or just a DM in general, when the party's traveling someplace, that gives you so much opportunity to prepare to be prepared and ready for where they're heading. If you're not ready for the direction they're going, just get some random encounters. Always have some random encounters and just pull them out of a hat. And so if the party leaves the town a little bit ahead of time, you can bring some of these out and then yeah. end the session so you're not you know, bring them to a town that you're just not prepared for, which happened in the first campaign all the time. You guys would go someplace I wasn't ready for. I'd say some things that I ended up not liking when I wanted to prep out the town later, but I'd already said it, so it already existed. So it's kind of a, a tough thing, which is why it's, it was nice to, for our second campaign, I kind of scrubbed a lot of what had happened. Obviously, it, was, it still exists, but I changed. I added more backstory, more deities, different things, Yeah. instead of just, keeping everything the the same i know something that gets me into a game or experience more than anything else what is it hit me with it is death an option is death an option you want to want the risks to feel important yeah because you play a video game and the fact that save files exist ruins a lot and you can yeah you got to hit on the iron man mode yeah you can do that or you can turn something on but understanding that this was a production that took money and Mm -hmm. work hours and blood sweat and maybe some tears as well of course the game isn't just going to become inaccessible the moment your character dies you paid 60 bucks for this yeah so games are forced into this sort of situation where death doesn't have a value and that's why i think dark souls is so widely popular is because that is taken into understanding and developed into the core of the game roguelikes succeed because of that but what i love about dungeons and dragons is if every character dies there's almost no tie or thing out there that gets wasted if that campaign ends other than some prep so that that's always scary and another thing that leads off of that is the time we talked about um is every encounter leveled properly Mm -hmm. or if we walk into something could it be way out of our league and we die and that 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 goes into again more of the how do you cater to the players and from my perspective i i do enjoy the sort of unease of walking into somewhere and being like can i do this (laughs) <laughs> is it possible? Am I going to die in one hit? And often when you say <laughs> roll initiative, that little nervous laugh you have at the beginning, I'm just like, oh God, what yeah, is about that, to happen? I think the biggest time that happened for me was 
in the last campaign, oh you guys were in a in a village, and the some guy he was a little off. I don't remember exactly what set you off, but something you didn't like. Oh, he said something about um, you just learned something that he was interested in this one person, and he wouldn't tell you why, and you were super intrigued in what was going on, and you decided to thunderstep with him. Yeah across the entire village to this uh, church steeple that you saw. Uh, public service announcement. I don't know if you guys know how that spell works, but it definitely can't go across an entire city. Yeah, and it makes a lot of noise and does damage to people, and I'm pretty sure you succeeded taking him. He was the lead of the guard. Yeah, but all the guards were there afterwards with all of your friends, and I was like, <laughs> okay, well, let's have some fun here. Luckily, you guys got out of it in one piece, but it was definitely an endeavor. How much dampening of the the situation did you do, or did you go full balls to the wall and just say, "Hey, I, this I, is I the went, situation"? I went full balls. Like I, like I said, it, risks are important. You guys decide to get crazy with it. I mean, <laughs> there were X amount of guards in that city. They were running around trying to throw. I mean, they didn't know what was going on. Obviously, they heard a loud thunderclap. People were running. They they uh, captured a good chunk of the party, but they ended up escaping. Yeah. Um, while you're fighting off against this one guy, <laughs> it was uh. It was definitely interesting. And yeah. same with like that, um, with the uh, Mind Flare encounter. You guys could probably kill two by themselves all right. But what was happening, well, Jason didn't know there was a Mind Flare there quite yet, and he was controlling one of your party members. Yeah. Um, and was slowly, you know, picking off each of you. And I ended up just being you still alive, I think, at one point. And n not, not to forget this very large thing that happened is my character forgot everything for the past two months, which yes. d with which is from level like six that we were at back to level one. I don't know yeah. any spells I have. I, my spell slots were gone because I was a warlock, so it doesn't matter anyways. Um, I didn't know anybody around me. I had a uh, tomb, tomb of Levistus, which saved my ass and I think the mm -hmm. entire situation. Um, uh, and this was before uh, this was this, they had gotten into a fight right beforehand, which is why he, he lost his memory. Yeah, uh, um, but there was a fight there with the mind flayers, and there was just one with a bunch of Duragar that they'd been kind of controlling. My plan for that was x amount of rounds. If you guys could clear it out, the initial encounter, maybe sneak into the the village if you guys wanted to, to leave whatever. But the encounter kept going on. You guys were unable to kill some of the creatures that was happening. A couple bad rolls happened. My X amount of rounds hit. Boom, here come, here comes the cavalry. Mm. So yeah, I mean, you guys are at an encampment with a bunch of things. So I want to make uh, I want to make it realistic that these things would eventually hear. You know, mind flayers will, will talk to each other. Things will happen. More will start heading your way. So in a, in, a, in case like that. Obviously, you guys could beat the initial encounter, but as time goes on, it might get more dangerous and things might change. So that's when uh, running is important, which think, you guys ended up doing. I think that's a really good way to tackle the is an encounter deadly or is an encounter possible? Thing. Yeah. Is having a condition that can make it deadly or having a condition that can make it work? So making it more gray rather than this or that. I didn't even think about that. It's important to, I think a lot of people also, uh, a lot of uh, new DMs, I definitely, I did for sure for a long time, will come into an encounter thinking the only solution to this encounter is killing everybody. Mm -hmm. When surrender can be an option or, you know, things, the, the environment changes, something will, will change this encounter. Or you guys do something and the you know, rocks fall down and block off part of the map or something. Just small, small little things to make the encounter feel more realistic right. not just black and gray it's it's tough for me because i am dming and i just kind of wanted to because i enjoy playing so much mm -hmm. but i am very lazy so <laughs> i don't want to do all of this prep and we've gone pretty in depth about this and i think next time we can talk about it as well is you know when is it okay to be a lazy dm and when is yeah. it okay to or when do you need to have more prep and how, how far in depth should you go? But it definitely matters. Uh, yeah, it's case it's by case basis for sure. What type of DM you are? Some people prefer you know improv and everything, and that's more than yeah. okay. 
if you can and get I, away with it. For my first two sessions, first two, three sessions, it was all improv. Basically, I had the idea of what main characters I wanted and the end result. And that was it. Right. Maybe a location or two. Um, and that's thanks to me being in theater and being able to kind of improv stuff. But what got really hard was when you guys looted somebody or when... Uh, an encounter happened or if you were in an, in a dungeon you need to prep some of those things more if you don't read monster manuals in your spare time right which you do which i do yeah yeah i didn't used to but that's that's how i've been able to write more story stuff is because i just i just kind of go through the monster manual which will probably have specific sessions specific podcasts about specific monsters and how to tell stories with them yeah um Something that was always tough for me, especially while in school, is, you know, I, f in my life, I can focus on three things, and school was the biggest chunk of that. Uh, the other two things always were secondary to it because, you know, school's for a grade, there's value to it, and you need to get this thing done, so your own desires are behind that. I, I, I feel like I'm wasting time if I'm playing a video game or watching anime. There's always that guilt of hey there's an assignment yeah. i need to do now that i'm something out of, i could be doing yeah and you mentioned free time and now that i'm out of college and i have a job that you know i, I could take home and, and do better and, and work more um but you know there's a lot of time given me during the day to do my job properly so when i get home it's my time and it's weird to set my own values for something i mm -hmm. am dming this campaign and i want to have my players really enjoy it that's a value that replaces getting a good grade. And it's interesting for me to readjust to that. And you've been, I, I, I admire the, the fact about you that you're able to focus on something that you want to do regardless of what other things you have. So I guess my kind of question here is what do you prioritize? Like the, the big question, what do you prioritize as a DM? Oof. Um, I think it can be a, a carnal a, a sin to to hop into DMing and just make a cool world and then not make a reason for the cool world to exist. Mm. So it, I think you want to build similar to books and stories. I think you want to build a, you want to start with a, a framework. You know, something, a, a base, you know, hook or a, a cool story that's happening or something, just something that's going on, and then build around that. Yeah. So you don't want to, you don't want to get crazy too fast. You want to go too large. Start mm -hmm. small and then build from there. And eventually, if you get a cool, crazy world, then you can just, in, while the party's off somewhere else, you can in the background start prepping out the other parts and get things ready and just slowly integrate that in if you so wish to. But I try to prioritize the initial areas that that the, that the party's in, what's going on. You know, items are important. Find find cool items. Find cool monsters. Um, like now I've been going through the monster manual or, or different resources that I have, finding monsters and telling story, learning their lore, telling stories about them. And then if I don't like exactly how the monster is, then I'll, I'll tweak it a little bit to fit the world that I, I have. Yeah, change don't, their, don't, their don't lore Don't be afraid to change stuff if you're DMing. Yes, change everything if you have I, to. I know it's, it's, a, a, it's a product made by Wizards of the Coast and it feels wrong to change things occasionally but they they don't know i think they even tell you to go crazy with it yeah probably like chris uh, and perkins think... the guy who writes a lot of the stuff he did his own he does his own stuff i don't think he does it anymore um oh, oh blank on the name of it. oh acquisitions incorporated i believe is what it's called and he would he ran a lot of their modules that they've that they've made but he he would even still tweak things change things to you know more fit the play style or more fit some of the characters he did it all the time which is i think is just a great example of change do things get and crazy with it for all you players out there my answer for what's the thing you should prioritize as a player is the exactly the same for a dm it's make a world and make it wonderful and crazy but also bound that to a reason why is it there what what is the reason as a player live in that world but you can't just live in the world because then that's just going by the whims of what's given to you ground that in your players desires and wants really i think the most important thing is making a background for your character 
mm-hmm. if if you have a DM like Ryan that wants to make a story and wants to cater to you, but also make this world a place for you to live and change and thrive, make a background for your character, leave some room for him to tweak it a bit and integrate it into his world, but live in there and have a reason and set it within your character's background. I think that's the most important thing. If you want to enjoy a session from a fulfilling role play perspective and we can get into more fights and, and combat at a later episode, but I think both me and Ryan 60 to 70% prefer character interactions and story. Yeah. I mean, I'm all for a cool, a cool encounter. Cool. But I want it, I want it to matter. I want it to mean something. Yeah. Give it a purpose to exist. And that is, I mean, someone like you were saying with the character, give it a purpose, just give everything a purpose to exist there. And I think, the rest will follow. I think people will, will fall in love with, with the world, fall in love with their characters because there's there's purpose to it. There's something bigger going on there. Yeah. And I think, Ryan, my sort of last question for you. Um, yeah. Now, be honest. Uh, <laughs> as a DM, what sort of salary are you expecting? Happiness. There you go. <laughs> you do a lot of want, work. <laughs> I, just want, uh, I just want people to, to care, honestly. I want, I want people to, to get into it. I think one of my one of my favorite things, and we, we try to make it a rule every now and again to, uh, I'll make a point to, you know, don't use your phone, get off of it. Or if someone's on their phone and they miss something, I'll just move on past and they can figure out what's going on. So something like their, if their character is, you know, looking at something else and then they, they miss a section, then they can ask the, the characters and the other characters ask yeah. what's going on. Um, but my favorite things is if there's a player who normally isn't super involved or is on their phone sometimes or just doesn't seem to be paying attention and then you just watch their eyes click and boom, they're into it. Something happened. They're, they're, they're super involved. They love what's going on. That, that's, I think that's, that's my favorite thing as a, as a DM is watching players care and, and get into the story or start crying because there's some sad <laughs> moment. Who does like that? La- <laughs> like last campaign, um, some guy was – I was I was believing he was dead. I didn't think you guys were gonna be able to get this guy back. Um, she just didn't have the capabilities to resurrect anybody at that point, as or so I thought. Uh, <laughs> and it was pretty emotional. You guys are getting pretty sad. It was a it was a rough moment there. And I I, I, I completely I, forgot the moment for a little bit, that. and now I remember I was the one who was able to do it. Am, yeah. am I right? Oh, God. wait, say that again. Was it was it in the the temple with the catacombs? Yes, it was in the catacombs where one of the players died. And there was a way to resurrect in the temple. But my thought process was I'd set, it, set up an NPC that was supposed to want that. But he had just died anyway. <laughs> so it didn't matter. Uh, you guys probably would have taken it anyway from him. Because you're like, I want my friend alive. I don't care what you want. Yeah. So, but yeah. Luckily, you. I think you remember that. that there was probably something there to check out. Well, the, the big stipulation there was that you know, in the lore of what the big bad had had to do with that same power was he had to, I think, was, was it kill his brother? That was the vampire. The yeah, vampire, that was, that's, yeah. A, that's, that's the Curse of Strahd stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So I understood that and I was like, I might have to do that. Yeah, you thought about it. Yeah. It was a moment. Um, But I think at the end here, we've kind of covered a good part of the beginning and what you should be thinking about or not, not should, but how we tackle and experience being yeah, a player and being things. a DM. So this is, we'll probably talk about this in a later, we keep saying that in a later episode, because this is kind of just the initial stuff, but you know, there's lots of different play styles. Just if you want to dungeon crawl, like the name says, then just dungeon crawl. Just, just mm-hmm. find, fi- make sure that if you're a DM, make sure your players are happy with what you're making. If they want to just fight, then just make a bunch of cool fights. But I think as a DM, also make sure you're happy with what you're making. If you're not, if that's not the type of campaign you want to run, let them know and find different players, and they can find a different DM. Find so just find people that that you know mesh well with what you want to do. Yeah, that's the biggest thing is figuring out who wants what and do they align. Get a group together, and bam, magic. And then the woes of scheduling come into play. Oh God, <laughs> and I think that's the next most important part. So we should probably talk about that in our next episode. Yeah. Um, so I guess to to wrap things off, there was a a question that I saw on the D and D Next Reddit page by the uh, the lovely 
Fiv555. And I want to get your thoughts on this. Hit me with it. See what you think. So which races, you know, the D&D races, can possibly or reasonably get away with not wearing any pants while being in public? (laughs) It's It's important. I never thought about it before. Turtle. Turtle? Yeah, they don't have to wear clothes. Tortle. I don't think they ever really wear clothes. That's my answer. Um, lizard guys, lizard folk. They don't. I have don't to wear know, anything. man. Do, mm, I, are they scaly down there? I, I would think so. Have you seen a? You've, have you seen? You've seen a salamander running around, right? Mm. Uh, my my answer stands. See, turtle. Unless turtle and turtle alone. Their their tail is sexual product. The real the real question or answer uh, or yeah. statement is why do do we need pants? Do we need pants? And that's that's diving into a whole other topic. So that's the most important thing about this <laughs> podcast. Uh, the main the name may be the Dungeon Crawl Pod, but it, the the biggest thing is, do you need to wear pants in Dungeons and Dragons? It's important. It's very important. Make sure but thank you guys for listening to this. Table's all right with that though. Yeah, just make sure. <laughs> yeah, but I guess we'll kind of listening. sign off here. Uh, I don't know where we're going next. We've. Uh, laid out some things for us by saying we'll talk about it next time. So hopefully that means you guys come back again. Heck yeah. All right. Take care, everybody. See you next Tuesday.